When tackling the restoration of a Victorian house like Chaplin House, it's crucial to consider the original construction methods and how Victorian houses were built. Back when Chaplin House was built, electricity and running water were non-existent luxuries. Consequently, the house wasn't designed to accommodate modern amenities like bathrooms, kitchens, or massive 60-inch flat screens. As the 19th century gave way to the 20th century, these features gradually found their way into homes, including Chaplin House. Hello and welcome to this episode of Chaplin House. This time we're going to discuss our methods for restoring the historic plaster throughout the house and show some of the rooms where we have repaired the walls and ceilings where the plaster was cracked or broken. In preparation for the plaster work throughout the house, we took a class at Northern West Virginia Community College on repairing historic plaster inside older homes. The class was taught by Cyril Venter an expert on historic preservation who has experience around the world restoring and preserving historic structures. In contemporary efforts to rehabilitate old Victorian homes, there's often a desire to blend the historic charm with modern conveniences, and this typically involves adding electrical outlets throughout, installing bathrooms complete with tubs, showers, toilets, and sinks, and outfitting kitchens with an array of modern appliances. Since Victorian construction didn't readily allow for these updates, Many opt to replace the original plaster interior walls with modern drywall. While the logic behind this decision is clear, it makes installing HVAC ductwork and electrical systems much easier, it introduces its own set of challenges. Stripping the walls down to the studs simplifies the process of integrating modern infrastructure, followed by attaching drywall, mudding seams, and painting. However, one immediate issue arises. The thickness of the drywall differs significantly from that of the plaster. Simply swapping the materials can result in doorways and windows having trim that doesn't align flush with the wall. One workaround is to remove the trim before replacing the walls and drywall. However, if you choose this route, it's essential to meticulously document and store the trim to ensure a seamless reinstallation process later on. Balancing the preservation of historic aesthetics with modern functionality presents a delicate dance in the restoration journey. And we've decided to repair the plaster walls inside the house wherever feasible. And this one, I also eyeball the water because when you Google, you know, how to make Portland lime cement, Portland lime mortar, they say, okay, well you get your cement mixer ready and you pour in six bucket fulls of sand and a bucket full of Portland, and a bucket full of lime, and then two buckets of water. And it's like, well, <laughs> right. I'm not making that much. I'm patching a little hole in a wall. When we first reviewed the damaged walls and plaster, we looked in each room and identified the types of cracks that were in that room. We did this in order to give ourselves a sense of which rooms would require the most work on plaster, and to plan out the process for each room. We divided the cracks or damaged plaster into three categories. Category one is a surface crack, which is really a crack that exists either in the paint or the paint in the white coat only. Category two cracks are cracks that are deeper and go through the white coat. Typically these cracks are cracks through the depth of the plaster, but did not involve delamination of the plaster itself. In other words, the plaster was still attached to the lath, but there was a deep crack running through the plaster. Category three cracks or holes have significant damage to the plaster surrounding the crack or the hole where the plaster is simply missing and the lath is showing through. We created these categories because there are different methods for repairing the cracks in walls and ceilings depending on the type or severity of the crack or damage. Often when repairing plaster, people use plaster screws and plaster washers to reattach delaminated plaster to the lath behind it. We have not come across any holes yet that we feel would benefit from this process. Here's our methodology for repairing cracks and holes in interior plaster walls. For the small cracks, the category one cracks, we use a white coat product over the crack. 
If the crack looks like it is into the plaster itself, we will use a screwdriver or similar tool to gouge out a little more of the material. Then we'll vacuum that out and use mesh tape to cover the crack, similar to the process for uh, covering a drywall seam. For the white coat, we use a diamond coat product or something like Easy Sand 90. Essentially, we are mixing a joint compound ourselves rather than buying it pre-mixed, which allows us to vary the consistency and the texture for various coats. For deeper cracks, for category two cracks, we apply a sturdy nylon mesh product and we plaster over that. We first score the surface in a hatch pattern and then a layer of mortar is applied to a large section of the wall. After the mesh is applied, we cover it with an additional layer of base coat, feathering the edges where it meets the wall. For this base coat plaster, we use a ceramic tile mortar, which is a product made from lime, Portland cement, and sand. Tile mortar is able to retain water long enough to repair the patch, and it has good adhesion properties. This makes it a great product to use as a base coat, and with the mesh, it's flexible enough to withstand the normal settling of the house over time. To fix the category three holes where the plaster has delaminated and the hole is down to the lath, we first pre prepare the lath with a product called plaster weld. The plaster weld prepares the wood by making it so the wood lath does not absorb the water from the plaster so quickly that the plaster fails to stick. As for the plaster itself, to fill the hole we use a mixture of six parts sand, one part lime, and one part Portland cement mixed by hand in amounts large enough to fill the holes we are working on. Typically these holes are filled in several coats, building from the bottom up to bring the plaster level with the rest of the wall. It's important to keep this mortar damp as we go to keep the plaster from failing before it has the time to properly cure. I mean that we use ceramic tile mortar instead of some other kind of mortar because tile mortar probably it goes in bathrooms it's probably breathable and okay that looks pretty good um i say we put this in the bottom and we make some more uh because that's next and that's going to be a lot harder this was a nice easy bit around because yeah. uh the second you've got to be doing it on a ladder it's harder and the second you're trying to work around really close to Trim work gets harder, and you lucked out in this room because the hardest, if I could never do a corner again, I wouldn't. And the corners the corner suck. Oh, any of the corners, all of them were miserable. But that and that one is trim. particularly bad. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just going to show you. So you can crack that thing open a little more. And you to hear the difference? This is good plaster. That's starting to fail. You can kind of hear that. Yeah. That yeah. sounds lighter than this. It, the, also, this is a brick wall and this is not a brick wall, so not going to sound exactly the same. But then you hear here. That's got to come out. Got to come out. And so, the easiest way to do it is to just run along the line that's already there because quickly it'll start popping out and see if, like that shouldn't be moving like that. It should not be that easy to take that away. 
but it is because that plaster has just failed. And so it just comes all the way off. It wasn't stuck to the lath anymore. I don't really want to drop that that far. I've pulled out what's bad here. This still sounds okay. That doesn't sound great here. Yeah. I think I've got to get here as well. Okay, so now I gotta vacuum it out. So from here, it's gonna be kind of difficult to do it here, but basically to patch this, I'll have to do it there. The good plaster is here like this. And what I'm gonna do, and th so this is my hole and this is my good plaster. What I'm gonna do is create a little line right behind where the good plaster is so that when I put the mortar patch in, it has a like key basically underneath still good plaster okay. so that it'll hang on and be in there stuck tight. Okay. If you like this video, I hope you'll like and subscribe to the channel.